Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? Today, we are going to talk about the COVID crisis impacting moms all around the country slash world. And then we're going to talk about a term all AP history students should know, Republican motherhood. Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%, the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. Episode 33. COVID crisis, and Republican motherhood. No, these two terms are not connected. Um, But (laughs) I was going to say, I was like, how are we getting from A to B? (laughs) We haven't touched on this theme in a long time. And with all the information in the media right now about how the COVID crisis is impacting moms, I felt like we should bring back this theme, Um, especially because we're going to talk about motherhood today. And... um, The connection here is basically, and this is one of the barriers to getting women's history into the classroom, is just how many people say things like, oh, like, yeah, I guess women's lives are important, but that's not history, right? Like, history is politics, economics, war, blah, blah, blah. And talking about these things that you ladies are talking about on the podcast isn't history. And To me, that is just a complete devaluing of women presently, your female students presently. And um, and if we devalue women right now, how the heck are we supposed to expect teachers to be teaching about them in the classroom? Yeah, exactly. So like, where does that come in if you don't put a a needle point to it and say, we're talking about this? Yeah. So the Washington Post, the New York Times, in the last few well months, really, they have been publishing article after article about how women are dropping out of the workforce in mass numbers um, they, yep. because of childcare responsibilities and um, and just the stress of trying to be full time childcare and do a full time job, like. You just can't. And I wanted to start our conversation with this uh, quote from the New York Times gender column um, where, and and this is, I'm pulling it off of Instagram, but it says, um, as a 24-year-old woman starting to think about what the next stage of my life will look like, the way working moms have been completely abandoned is seriously tipping the scale towards me not wanting to have kids, not wanting kids. And that was Kate from Arlington, Virginia. And um, I, it just. It's not surprising at all. Um, But I think you and I could even talk about our own personal experiences. It's like we chose lives that could, and careers that could potentially fit family in, um, knowing that what our responsibility would be in that process. And so I do think that young women today have a lot of choices ahead of them especially in the current climate where childcare is not readily available or affordable for that matter um, when you're just starting out in your career. So absolutely, it should be something to consider. I wonder what young men are thinking about because I, from my experience and the stats that I've read and the articles that I've read, when young men go into the workforce, family is not a priority that they need to consider when taking an opportunity. Yeah. Or, you know, they consider their family and how their family will benefit from them collecting more money, you know, from that opportunity. But it's not about time with the family is not part of the consideration. Yeah. Right. As, as frequently as it is with women. Absolutely. Um, but I think it's just, you know, the New York Times has been um, putting, publishing photos of these working moms that are just exhausted. They are like, yeah. uh, you know, you know, trying to balance raising their kids. The kids are running around while they're and, – and you ha- and I have, you know, as we're Zooming and when you're Zooming with your um, – your work your your team that you work with like your kids are Mm -hmm. jumping around in the background and oh yeah this I mean this is a good story I was meeting with a new vice president at our company really really nice guy he's based out of California 
and I'm, you know, helping him on a project or whatever. And so it's the first time we're interacting. And my office door is typically open if my boys are home because I want them to feel like they can come in and out if they want me because they are a priority. Um, I know that everyone has that luxury with their organizations, but thankfully my company was really great about kids being home. Um, but in that same regard, my son Nolan comes in, he is potty training and butt naked jumps on the guest bed that's behind me in my conference call. And he's like, mom, I pooped on the potty. <laughs> and the VP is on this conference call with me and he was like, great job, buddy. Oh my God. That's amazing <laughs> that they did that though. <laughs> and I was like, his name is Kelly. He's a nice guy. And he was just like. Nice work, guy. Nice work. Like, keep it up. You know, we're all real proud of you. Like, made it. Like, <laughs> he was like, thanks. <laughs> and Nolan jumps off the bed, jumps out of the room. I was like crying, laughing. But, you know, this is the moment we're in. You know, I, I can give you so many stories. And I'm sure our listeners have a zillion of ridiculous scenarios that have happened on Zoom. But or on, you know, video conference calls. But yeah, yeah, we're balancing. Everyone's juggling. I, it's strange to say that you're thankful that your kids are younger in this moment, but like really thankful I don't have middle schoolers or high schoolers in this, in this really difficult time. Yeah, trying to stay on top of them and getting them doing their work and holding them accountable. Yeah, absolutely. I've, And some kids thrive in remote learning and some are really struggling. I mean, my nephew is one of them and I feel for him. Remote learning is not how he is best equipped um, for education. And so he's struggling. And this is a kid that was straight A student taking, you know, higher level math courses because he's more advanced to becoming a a C and D student. And And is that like... That's not a failing on the parents' part because they're juggling, like you were saying. They're doing the best they can. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I do think, though, that there is some sort of weird... Uh, I don't, I don't really know what, uh, you know, when it comes to issues with gender, I I struggle because I'm not a philosopher. I'm not like, I don't know (laughs) how to, to imagine how this could have gone differently, but it is just crazy to me that we were like, okay, so all jobs, schools, everything is going to shift to remote. And we just sort of looked at moms and said, do it. And like, (laughs) and moms are like, okay, so, so do my job and watch my kids now. Interesting. And like, you know, I I struggle because sometimes I wish my kid was in middle school or high school because then I could just say like, go do your room and do your work over there. You can't, my toddler doesn't understand that and needs my attention constantly. And it is so stressful to like, I feel yeah. what's stressful about it is I feel like I can't even think a full thought before I have to like, Oh my gosh. Like look over there and see what's going on. And then I'm like, okay, what was I trying to say in that email? Um, <laughs> you know, it's just like, you can't car like, what's the word I'm trying to think of? Like carpet compartmentalize. Carpet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so like you can't just like say this is this and this is this and then they don't come together it's like no no no. it's all a muddy mess i'm surprised half my emails haven't started with like dear so and so yes i think that meeting time sounds wonderful no you can't throw that (laughs) (laughs) put that down stop (laughs) stop biting your brother yeah it's yeah it's i also think that people are giving each other a little more space for grace at this very moment where everyone you know, and I have coworkers that are at home by themselves and they've been alone, no kids, no spouse, no nothing for months. Yeah. That does something to you too. So I think, yeah, you know, I think everyone's just trying to be a little more graceful in these moments of just saying like, deal with what you got to deal. Like the other day, my son banged his head off the floor. The other one did something else. And it was like, I'm going to call you back. Mm -hmm. This is more important. And thankfully, again, I have a company and a job that 
They're really gracious about that, yeah. you know. Whereas you have students that are sitting there, and it's like you can't be like, "I'll be right back, guys." My son just <laughs> bounced off a trampoline. Yeah, I mean, we have go. we have set class times. It's like like we're in we're constantly in and out of remote and in person. But when we're remote, like it is set class times. I am holding my child because I have twenty five minutes with my students, and so I'm like, okay, so. And I'm like giving a lecture. He's literally screaming over me. And my kids are just like, what? My, we're, get, we're getting, we're getting nothing, nothing out, of, out this. of this other than like, this is crazy. And I'm like, yep, I know. We're, yep, it is. It, it, it's absolutely crazy. I don't, I am, I am so grateful that in your private sector job, you have felt <laughs> like there is grace. I have just felt ugh, like we're just expected to keep going. And you know there's no yeah that there's no empathy um for a lot of a lot of people out there and I think that that's awful I'm you know I always operate in the positive but on the other side of this the workforce has changed which is phenomenal for mothers remote work has become the go-to for jobs coming up open things that have been posted people have had to change their companies and they're realizing it works you know like some companies are more productive right now that's way more productive they're they're selling more they're doing more they're creating more and i don't you know obviously there's sectors that have been highly highly effective that are not going to adapt to this new model but they can't and nor should they you know it's it's just gonna be different but the companies that were really set in their ways about remote employees I'm so excited that they've changed their tune, that they're doing the right thing for people, that they've seen the value in remote team members. And being in the recruitment and talent acquisition space, I can now hire people from all over the country. Yeah. I, can go, I can go out and get the best of the best and because I'm, I'm not geo-focused on right. you know, New Hampshire or Boston. And that's, or, frankly, you know. I mean, that's the thing that has been holding women back in the economy is is for the years. lack of flexibility for having kids. And women, I think both socially and then like physically just have to be closer to their kids in a lot of cases. And um, and and we've talked in our equal pay episode about, about yeah. you know, that it is child rearing that is really the only financial, like the, the significant difference in, and the cause of the pay gap. That's really the cause. And, you know, yes, there are, some examples of just like flat out sexism and like paying men more than women and whatever. Um, but it's, it's child rearing that creates this massive gap. And, um, and, but I also think that right now we're seeing that in the pandemic and we're seeing parents stressed to the nines. And I, you know, you talked about childcare before I'm sitting here going, okay, so when are we going to fix this child care issue? Like, when is that going to be something that is available to people and, and and more flexible and you know where we are child care is a nightmare you have to nightmare. you have to get on a list for child care before your child is even born like it is and that's not abnormal that's yeah. everywhere and i also think that's probably not going to change it's very much a, a demand supply scenario you know they're not Child care places aren't going to open just to have one or two kids there and just have open spots all the time. They have just enough for what they need and the kids age out and it's a whole thing. So, you know, I read this book when I was pregnant with Nolan and um, it was Raising Baby. It's this um, American woman. She's in France raising her child. Um, I think she ends up having twins. I'd have to go back and reread it to give you all the f- facts and features. But it's a great book. Um, just on the differences in a French culture versus American culture and how they value raising children and, and the core competencies that they want children to have as they enter into school mm-hmm. age. Um, and they have f- government-funded child care. So there's, it's called La Crush. It's in your neighborhood. You gain access to it. Everyone within that radius gets to go to that school in particular, and everyone has that. It's government run. Every edu- every classroom is the same. The learning styles are the same. You know, it's it's very structured, and it's from infancy to five, and then they go from that age into the elementary school. Like, why don't we have we have public school already? Yeah. 
Why not just extend the yeah. model from birth to five? Right. Is it is it that challenging? I don't know. Well, I mean, it's there are there is a serious need, and and I don't. Biden has floated the idea, and I am <laughs> waiting <laughs> with you know because because the other thing is like if you are like you know, work is important for women. It is important to to feel like you are contributing to the society and the world. And there's something that is yours. Um, work is in necessary too for most families. Um, like they, re- they rely on two incomes and, um, yep. and it is scary. I, you know, I had a lot of issues leaving my kid at daycare the first time. I, I mean, I can't, I literally can't drop him off because it make, I cry. My husband does it every day because I like can't do it. <laughs> but it, This is where we differ. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but it's hard because, you know, most of the people that are at the daycare, I, I think are wonderful and incredible and I'm so grateful for them. Um, but then occasionally it's like, oh, we have this visiting college student who's here and I'm like, okay, uh, can we vet her please? And like, send me information about her. Like I, it makes me. Yeah. Well, yeah. Communication at our in particular daycare is a little different, but right. I get what you're saying. There's just no, there's standard. no standard for care. There's no, you know, the, the variety from all the child centers around us is terrifying in terms of like the education that these people have had. And, um, it's terrifying. And right now in particular, they're closing at random and so like you know for us we've had child care most of the time and then randomly they'll be like okay so <laughs> we're closing for three weeks or forever or we don't know and the yeah. anxiety is it's killing all, me. it's all a toss-up but it's also you know you think about bringing it back to the mom like moms if you were laid off trying to find a job when you're also trying to help your kids through school Ugh. That is terrifying. And the stress that adds to that of instability and not knowing where your next paycheck's coming from and trying to set up, you know, unemployment. And that's a whole rigmarole that is a nightmare Mm -hmm. as well. There's just the amount of stress put on women at this critical moment in history is, is never been seen before. And who knows what the long term effects of this will be on women in our lifetimes but also on the children that went through this as Mm -hmm. well yeah i mean we are watching this like myth collapse of this idea that you can have it all and you can't because crises like this one make those worlds intersect and it's terrifying it's it's and it's radically shifting black culture at this very moment as well you know they are that is a whole subset of this conversation of the black community is being terrorized by covid and impacted at a much higher rate than the white culture within the u.s so it is dangerous it's scary to see the long-term effects of that and when what will happen over time for these families yeah yeah. black women um are filling so many roles right now um so i i'm just curious you know (laughs) what what does this mean and are we going to going to recognize the double burden that we've put on women and um remedy that i'll tell you one thing i yeah i do think that there's going to be a much more sympathetic audience as we go forward from men who have also been in this scenario yeah. now with their children yeah. where they can't just you know say oh yeah that's that's all for a mom it's like they've had to step up yeah. too in big yeah. ways um and it, it'll be I imagine it's, I, it's exciting it's exciting for me being in, in human resources to see the evolution of what's going to impact the workforce at this moment um and where it's going to make some really great changes um but I also love that executives are finally open to creativity around how their their teams are being developed and designed and where they see value most yeah. 
Which is and I imagine cool. in every family around the country, they've had conversations about this. And if there are Absolutely. inequities within the parenting dynamic, um, that probably mm-hmm. has been highlighted recently. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and <laughs> well, that might be a really there's good a lot thing. of things on the on the rise. Unemployment is is starting to come back down, but uh, divorce definitely high on on yeah. the list. So it's sad. It's you know. It's definitely scary at this moment, but um, I I'm excited. But it's like the reckoning this is going to evolve. It's- yeah, it was kind of the this needed to happen for people to more heavily rely on the technology that was already available, but then also identify ways that we are leaving a core piece of our our population out of the conversation when it comes to building a workforce, and that is moms, women people that are caretakers they are finally part of the conversation of how to develop a team which is exciting all right brooke let's take a little break and when we come back okay. we will talk about <laughs> republican motherhood interesting <laughs> be right back <laughs> for lesson plan ideas and how to teach women's history go to our website www.remedialherstory.com You can also follow us on Instagram or Facebook. If you think what we're doing is needed, please consider joining our Patreon community. Through Patreon, you can sponsor a podcast with a small donation. Patrons get access to behind-the-scenes information, gear, and bonus episodes. But more importantly, patrons are putting their money where their mouth is and making a financial commitment to getting women's history into the K-12 curriculum. We are so grateful to our patrons who sponsored this episode. Our herstory makers, Jeffrey. Our herstory heroes, Brooke and Barbara. Our historians, Jamie and Kent. And our allies, Nicole, Mark, Sarah, Leah. Thank you. You guys make this show possible. Welcome back. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, Brooke. Let's get into Republican motherhood. Okay. So to clarify, yes. these are not Democrat versus Republican. <laughs> no, 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 no. So, yes. So that's, I think that's interesting because, um, you know, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party evolved because they are proponents in some ways of a republic versus a democracy right and we are a blending of those two you know principles um in the u.s today and right after um the american revolution which is where we're going in time um we we were much more a republic uh you know white men could poor white men couldn't really even vote in a lot of cases um and so you had to be a land owning man in order to vote and it's not really until the 1820s that we see the expansion and and universal white male uh suffrage um so yeah so we were much more of a republic and it's not till the 1820s that we see the rise of the democratic party and this idea that it should be more of a democracy than it was um and then you know of course we see people advocating for more of a democracy in the democratic party today um so no we're going to be talking about this this new republic and um so it comes so republican motherhood is a term uh for um and and this is is something that you know u.s history students would learn about in in class it's a term for this philosophy that um of how a mom should act and behave in a republic versus a mom in you know some other system of government and um, American women's world around this time really reverts into the home. Um, you know, the the women of the early republic are um, much more recluse than the colonial kind of backwoods badass women of of that era. <laughs> um, and they um, 
are viewed, you know, in this domestic role. And part of the reason they're being domesticated, for lack of a better word, <laughs> is because they can. You know, that when, right. like, like, access to consistent food supplies and goods and services are, are you know, those are more consistent. So they right. can. Um, and so women are seen in their role as child rearing people and um people are realizing that in order to have a functioning republic right and and later a functioning democracy we really need to have an educated populace and women as primary caregivers are the primary educators right until a child so where did this philosophy stem from like who was like aha let's uh make sure women can yeah so, um, you know, that's like a, like, well, okay. So here's a piece of it. So in the Northeast in particular, um, there's a long history of women reading, right? Because, of, right. uh, like Puritan, you know, philosophy, yep, religious, religious philosophy yep. about, you know, being able to read the Bible. And so Protestants in general value women being able to read the Bible beyond that is sort of like. Uh, gets gets wishy washy. Um, women in the early 1800s are beginning to enter into the workforce, and they're working mm-hmm. outside of the home. They are working on farms or in factory systems in the Northeast, and this is sort of you know a lot of people sort of stuck their nose up at that. Like this is this is against our traditional values, and that's kind of problematic. Um, and so there's an effort by some of these traditionalists, maybe the Jeffersonian, um, Americans. So who kind of buy into Thomas Jefferson's philosophies, um, to keep women in the house and help them realize their important job that they have there. And, um, and so it's, I would say it's not necessarily one person. It's a, you know, confederacy of people that are, that are working right, to, yeah. to keep women there to not, you know, be tempted to work and earn money outside the home and to, to appreciate the really important job that they're, they're doing at home. And this is, you know, kind of part of the, the cult of true womanhood. Um, there's definitely some overlap between some of these, these philosophies of the early 1800s and antebellum eras in, in U.S. history. Um, so yeah so does that help give you some like context okay yeah no it does it's very helpful so when we're thinking about republic or republican mothers tell me about these women in this yeah so (laughs) we have in this country rights to life liberty and we are able to uh we have so many more freedoms than people prior you know in in other systems of government but part of part of freedom is and part of your responsibility in a republic is you need to know your rights right Right. like there are very few circumstances where people will tell you what your rights are and um you know like the miranda rights i think are are almost odd right in our in our system where people are like hey you have a right to an attorney <laughs> like you know and but i mean i'm i'm imagining the history of the miranda rights is pretty interesting oh, yeah. but uh um i would imagine they came into play because people didn't know their rights and then it became a shit yeah show. right and i think people you know it's interesting because like we in school we memorize the preamble to the constitution right that's so weird like people probably didn't don't do that in a, in a lot of other places um and but like we know what and we spend a lot of time teaching these these democratic values so that even when you know so that people can can function in this system um and mm-hmm. so you know women in this time are a little bit more educated than their mothers and grandmothers had been. Um, so they knew a lot more about the world outside of their home. And so they were able to teach their children about those things. And so those would have been part, in addition to knowing their rights and knowing their responsibilities, would have been part of just sort of like teaching, especially their sons about the world that's out there. 
right? Right. Um, yes. So, you know, they're, they're finding a lot of jobs that are considered like suitable and appropriate for women um, in this time period and things that they can do from within the domestic sphere and um, sphere. And one of the things you know, that I think is really interesting is that a lot of women started writing and teaching, um, as professions, um, because they were appropriate and you could still do, you could write while caring for your children. Um, and a lot of single women who were either widowed or, um, a bit, you know, neglected, um, took up these, you know, writing gigs and teaching gigs in order to provide for their family. And it was sort of this like loophole of respectability. Um, yeah, I think, which I think is just so. What years are we talking the about here? Early 1800s. So it's sort of, this, this is like okay. a, it, it's a philosophy that sort of covers a few decades of time in the early 1800s. Okay. Uh, really after the war of 1812, when, you know, our national, um, identity is not in crisis anymore and and we can really sort of like begin to uncover who we are and there's a lot of um shifting in uh, in political parties in our country at the time and so it makes sense that there would be like a uh while there's a lot of change there's also a lot of push for um traditional values at the same time okay um um, interestingly, I was just thinking about this, is that um, Plymouth State, where we both have degrees from, um, actually started in 1808 as a pioneer institution for women to become teachers. Yes, I did know that, actually. How cool is that? I know. <laughs> I was just thinking, I was like, wait, I've heard this story. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was called like... Um, the women, it was uh, Plymouth Academy, and then it became, I think, like, the normal school, um, and then it became the Plymouth Teachers College. That's fascinating. Yeah, hmm. I think, yeah, I, there and there were lots of women's teachers' colleges that were popping up all over. Um, at, and, and really, they would be reserved for, like, upper-class women. Um, the first female college to open up would be in 1837, which was Mount Holyoke down in Mass, um, which yep. for everyone else is probably up in Mass, but yeah. <laughs> or in, or in Mass. Mass, <laughs> yeah. Massachusetts is the place we're talking about. But yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, yeah, I think th- these teacher colleges are a really good example of sort of this respectable thing that women could go on, um, could go on to do. I uh, recently had the chance to read a book called Patriots, Prostitutes, and Spies, and it's about women in the Mexican American War. And he talks a little bit about Republican motherhood in the first part of the book as he's introducing this war to everybody uh, and basically to show that women's um, engagement in political activities, whether it be temperance or suffrage or Mm -hmm. anti-war, is really like they are poised to participate by the 1840s. And um, so a piece, so he says here on page eight of his book, he said, um, men anxiously sought to identify such a contributing role, which would help stabilize a culture seemingly gone awry and also obviate the threat to male dominated public and political economic sphere. Accompanied by sympathetic women, they devised the notion of, quote, Republican motherhood, end quote, and the, quote, cult of true womanhood, end quote, as defining a proper societal position and appropriate duties. Broadly speaking, these involved emphasizing the place of the mother and the wife within the home. Um... He goes on to talk about how this was all sort of happening at the same time as the Second Great Awakening, um, which most history students would learn about. And um, a lot of women are converting to this sort of like um, new wave religion that is very uh, different than, um, than 
all some of the traditional, you know, Calvinist um, Puritan faiths that they grew up with, and it seems a bit more um, to like meet them where they are, and and yeah, um, and that you know, scares people because it's like this big change. So send them back, send them back. And I I do love bringing up stuff like that because people talk about the Great Awakening in their history class, but then don't go the next step, which is to say, and how does that impact women, right? And, and, right. And then what is the evolution of the society because of that? Yeah, exactly. So women um, were kind of on both sides of this concept of Republican motherhood. And, you know, with any cultural expectation of course there there are outliers and there are people that are different but basically there's this idea that women need to be in the home educating their children um inspiring them to be good citizens and um the what's interesting about this is it's mostly being driven by men and all of these women who are talking about how women need to stay home, but they have like made a living giving speaking careers. And I think that's really fascinating that like they are writing and lecturing around the country and um, and really defying Republican motherhood. And yet they're preaching Republican motherhood. And so it's kind of this like weird <laughs> irony. <laughs> um, it's like, wait a second. Aren't you supposed to be at your house? <laughs> right. So I, I don't know. I just think that's just, there's always just such a funny contradiction when, you know, when people start. But if there's anything that there's never going to be a lack of, it's women giving other women yeah. advice <laughs> for Christ's sake. Like that's <laughs> just whole industries on it. I feel like that's all Instagram <laughs> has become. But it's like, why is that the only space that women feel confident to just, like, take the reins and chat about, like, how to be a mom? It's great. It's, like, good for you. You figured it out. You, f- you found the puzzle pieces. But it's one of those things where it's, like, it doesn't – the only re- prerequisite is being a mom. <laughs> and then you just get to say whatever makes sense for you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I think two women come to mind as kind of a hilarious, like, butting of heads. So Fanny Wright was an English woman who immigrated to the United States in 1825. She was attractive, energetic, and possessed, according to uh, Gail Collins. And, um... I'm, there's never enough fannies oh, in the world. right, Can I know. You just, like, put that out there? Like, where are all the fannies Yeah, gone? name your child fanny, please. <laughs> <laughs> please, and let us know. That would be great. Um, so she had, uh, she made uh, her, her living, really, traveling around the country, giving lectures. And um, this was really... in in sharp contrast to this idea like women should be in the home women should be taking care of children and here she is just traveling around around the countries um she was the main speaker at a fourth of july celebration in indiana and this might have been the first time a woman addressed a mixed audience at a public gathering in america and so that was dated 1828 um Go Fanny. Go Fanny, go. Um, And so she draws a lot, like, big crowds who, you know, perhaps just wanted to see the crazy woman lecturing, you know? Like, (laughs) what is this lady? I mean, I'm sorry. Entertainment at that time period, not booming Metropolis where Lady Gaga is going to show up. If a woman speaking is probably the highlight of most (laughs) of (laughs) Yeah. Um... So, yeah, Gail Collins said, quote, it was a phenomenon only slightly less surprising than a talking dog. Yeah, like she was like, that's how crazy people saw women lecturers to be. Um, You do you know Harriet Beecher Stowe? She wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin. Okay, so her sister, Catherine Beecher, was appalled by Fanny Wright. Oh, excuse you. She said, quote, who can look without disgust and abhorrence upon such as such an one 
Oh, women. Such an one as Fanny Wright, with her great masculine person, her loud voice, her untasteful attire, going about unprotected and feeling no need of protection, mingling with men in stormy debate, and standing up with barefaced imprudence to lecture in a public assembly? Oh my god, Fanny and I should be best <laughs> friends. We're... What? And the irony, of course, is that Catherine Beecher was a public woman herself. Um, and Gail Collins quickly yeah, points like, that what, out. What are you doing? <laughs> oh, my God. Um, she traveled around the whole country. She did raised funds for all sorts of different projects and, um, and you know, dis- different initiatives and social causes that she was working on. Um, but it's something about this this awesome. public life that is so scary to this this culture of the Republican mother, right? Like this is her job to be in the home and and with the children, um, and I think we see that play out today. There, this is. Oh my god! I was just like the parallel. Right. I mean, the parallels between there, there is the the box mother that like does the right things the organic food there's all these like the right yeah. mom scenarios i'm glad that i do feel like we're part of a generation that's like do you and like make whatever you want to yeah. work thankfully whereas i don't think our mothers had that luxury um but there is an evolution of it at least but it's certainly still here today it's still around yeah i know so i think the republican motherhood is something worth addressing because i think kids can make a lot of parallels to the present day with it. Makes sense. Um, and really, what is the expectation on on moms? Where does it have to be mom versus, like, anybody else? And anybody who could be a caretaker. Right. That would be a tough subject to navigate, I think, in a school classroom setting, just because everyone's family looks yep. different. And so what the, what someone would deem as appropriate in one household may not even remotely exist in another. So that would be a tough topic to navigate, but great debate. But I I think you could do, you know, this is where other social studies classes could, could chime in and support that with, with other research. Like in psychology, there are lots of studies about the benefits of maternity and paternity leave and to what point staying home is like there, there shows benefits in in kids' lives, um, and versus not, and um, yep, and so I think you know four months. By the way, is the answer to that is what the research points to. It's sort of like that's really beneficial to have four months with your kid, and then after four months, sort of it's just a rapid decline in benefits. Right? They can they can benefit from daycare yeah. after that. Um, there's a really cool study, uh, actually documentary about, it's called Baby, it's um, on the Discovery Network, but it was essentially that there is no chemical difference in a brain of a male or yeah. female in the attachment to their yeah. child. And it's like, right. so having a class even watch that piece to utilize with this, it's like, there you go, there's actually no chemical difference in the body or the yeah. brain between a mother and a father towards yeah, a baby. Yeah, totally. Totally. It's completely societal pressure and expectation. Yeah. Fascinating. It is. Um, the Republican motherhood concept, though, uh, even in that time, varied from location to location, household to household. And people, I mean, just as today, people have to do what they have to do in order to have funds to provide for their child and their, their families. And... Um, you know, the Great Awakening is partly awakening women to some of the evils that are out there in the world, whether it be alcoholism or poverty or um, the plight of immigrants who come to our country. And so women are helping these causes, you know, Beecher Stowe included, um, to, to, uh, Catherine Beat. To Sorry, Im- Catherine Beecher included to-, um, to to impact the world around them outside of their homes. Right, exactly. Thinking more societal versus you know, inc- you know, just looking inward to how they would benefit their own family. Right. It's looking outward to how they are, their actions could impact others and build a bigger 
community. Middle class urban women were expected to perform women's work at home while women on the frontier um, really could like leverage agency and the respect of their communities because they had needed skill sets in order for that frontier community to thrive. Um, But of course, all of these qualities of the true woman did not extend to enslaved women. And um, laws in slave states stated that children born of enslaved mothers became the property of the masters. And so that, in essence, makes it legal to rape female slaves in order to grow your slave population. And so it's this, like, weird thing where it's like, yes, you know, motherhood is very important. Moms should be with their children, blah, 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 blah. But not enslaved moms, because we could just rip their children from them and sell them off, right? That's that's no big deal. And so it's, you know, in the antebellum era in our country, it's a really good example, you know, bringing women into it and that uh, difference and in how black women and w- white women are being treated I think is just so fascinating Ugh, it's awful um you know this is just uh, it just really really bugs me um women of color (laughs) had to work Yes. <laughs> women of color had to work so hard to establish spaces where they could assert their right to basic things, let alone motherhood and, you know, the right to protect their their children, um, which, you know, like and it's just it's just fascinating to me that people would be, you know, moms shouldn't be in factories. They need to be home with their children. But yes, I'm going to buy this, you know, blouse that was produced by a, you know, from cotton picked by a female slave in the South who was working, by the way, outside of her home and away from her child when she picked that cotton. Right. And often, too, women who were enslaved on farms were often caretakers of white women's children at the disservice of their own children. There's multiple, multiple examples that you can pull from history of where black women who were enslaved cared for white women's children and breastfed them, clothed them, you know, all these things. To the detriment of their own right, children. Right, right, yeah. I mean, they spent their their lives raising white kids, you know? Exactly. So I think that that sort of helps illustrate that this was an ideal that was not extended to certain peoples, was not possible for other peoples, right? Because of, like, you know, being on the frontier and the, the practicality of needing money, needing food needing right survival right um and it was really an ideal that was set by middle and upper class women um and and just like always right they tend to be the- well yeah if you have means you can think about other things other than your basic necessities and so when that happens the thought evolves it's not just food shelter heat you know it's all those things now that you're past that you can think about how do I, you know, help my child become more educated? How do I get my daughter to be married to someone famous? Yeah. <laughs> the things that consume your thoughts when you have money. Right. It would be, so for kids, I think this would be a really interesting example of something to investigate and look at, you know, what were these women, for the women that were home, what were they thinking about? on a daily basis and what were what was on their mind um did they realize how uh, just restricted their world was or did they maybe not feel that way at all and it would be interesting to look at diaries with kids um that that women were writing about in this this time um or even like the study of inequities at that moment too between the races it's that's a powerful discussion Um, ask kids, why do you think it was important for women to have roles outside the home? And that could be a question you ask them presently, right? Like, why is that good for, for people? Does it fill people up? Does it, you know, like help, you know, you can help them understand these Choices. choices. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, yeah, like you mentioned, devaluing, you know, the talents and accomplishments of enslaved women, um, 
and 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 rather their lives and their families and not you know not in valuing those yeah. things and do we have trickles of that today where we where we don't value their time protect their time i mean i th- think about like how crazy it is that you know i feel i am i am privileged to have a job where i can take sick time if i need to to be with my kid i have um vacation time i have all these these things um built in to to ensure that i have time with my child but i'm also in like a privileged job and there are lots of jobs where you don't have those protections and a lot of times those are um job you know poor poor people are working those jobs and so what are what are we saying about motherhood do we do we value those people as moms or do we want them to have the same protections um well and it goes back to the american dream and what is that and who gets to have one becomes the ultimate question Um, When you start to think about and look at some of these benefits um, and privileges that different people have and where do they show up and how do they show up and how do we start to highlight them and then think about the evolution of our own culture to change them. Absolutely. So we have a lesson plan up on our website, an inquiry into Republican motherhood and whether this was attainable for all people. Um, and yes. I think it's a really good one for, for teachers to check out. Awesome. Great. Oh, Brooke, Thanks, thank you Kelsey. for joining me tonight. It's so nice to see your face. I know. Same. <laughs> Next week we'll be back in person. Woo. Quarantine over. So I'm Brooke Sullivan. I'm Kelsey Eckert. <laughs> see you next time. <laughs> Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.